Welcome back. I would now like to introduce Alex Moody, who is going to be giving us a presentation titled Prospects for Peace and National Reconciliation in Burma slash Myanmar. And before leading into his presentation, we're first going to watch a brief campaign film from Burma Partnership, the organization that Alex works with, titled Guns, Briefcases, and Inequality, the Neglected War in Kachin State. Alex is the Research and Advocacy Officer at Burma Partnership, which is a network of organizations advocating for and mobilizing a movement for democracy and human rights in Burma. And Alex has been monitoring and conducting research on Burma's peace process for the past two years. Please welcome Alex. Um, that, that has been used for uh, project 
infrastructure, natural gas pipelines. Um, there, there's been uh, a serious problem with land confiscation um, and forced displacement uh, to facilitate uh, the construction of large-scale development projects, including hydropower dams, uh, uh, mineral mines, and, and other projects. No, no. In the past two years, since the war broke out in June 2011, we have seen uh, mass murders of uh, civilians, bombing of civilian targets such as schools and hospitals, um, gang rape and sexual assault of women by the military, and enforced disappearances, abductions that have taken place in full view of other witnesses and for which the authorities continue to deny any liability or any responsibility. Serious international crimes have continued to take place in the past three years despite the so-called opening of reforms in the country. We've seen a uh, commitment of mass atrocities in Kachin State, in Mandalay Division, in Pegu Division, in Arakan State. Hopefully there is a lot of briefcase brief and tortures and forced labor and uh, human rights abuses in, in the Kachin area. So, uh, but uh, that is perhaps done by the military, but we can say it's intentionally what they have done. So that is uh, uh, what is, and also the religious persecution, they destroy the churches and also the targeting to the civilian. Where there is a uh, uh, um, the military police army, uh, there is a uh, rape cases. So they are not safe anywhere where there is a uh, army. By colonial soldiers, um, in some cases, the angry. And many of these crimes are committed with impunity. Um, there has been very limited accountability for sexual violence within the military. Um, and the accountability that has uh, that has occurred has been inadequate. There have been cases where Kachin people, and in fact, in other cases of, of serious international crimes, where other people in Burma have tried to. Uh, take their cases to local courts in order to, uh, to get remedy, to extract remedy or to ensure that people abducted uh, or subject to enforced disappearances were surfaced. And in the case of Somla Roja, who was abducted by military troops in full view of her family and whose family members continued to petition the courts to try and uh, get uh, the, the case investigated, they were flatly turned down. In fact, the courts uh, favored the accused, the military, and refused to hear testimony from the family, from the petitioners, from the, the, the people who had put forward that case. The, this is consistent. This is consistent with the general pattern that, that over, the, over the years that the judicial system in Burma is not impartial nor independent. It all boils down to the Constitution, which legitimizes and perpetuates a situation of impunity. Nobody try to solve the and yeah, to the court, sue to the court, yeah. Because it's useless because we already tried one case, two cases already. It doesn't uh, accept by the court. 
impunity in Burma is by law. Um, so by law, the military cannot be held accountable for past abuses that have occurred over many years, many decades. Um, and this is a very serious obstacle to genuine reform in the country. For me, justice means not. Justice means we, uh, we, we also need a good uh, institution and rules of law. If the you know, there is no rules of law, no good constitution for the, for the people, that will, there will be no justice. Because uh, at, the, uh, at the trial, we don't, when well, we people didn't get any, you know, like equality at the front of the trial. For lasting peace to occur in this part of the country, the first and foremost, the abuses need to stop. Um, so I think there needs to be a change, fundamental change in the behavior of the Burmese military in the ethnic areas. Um, and until that happens, a lasting peace uh, will be impossible. <laughs>
and embedding in all their agreements the commitment to international humanitarian law and human rights principles. So um, the regime itself is getting the message that yes, the international community will make statements, but they're not a fighting was happening in northern sense of women's participation and civil society's participation would be uh, important. It was it, it is important for the you know for the change for transformation. in the east, the Sham in the uh, northeast, 
the, the kitchen in the far north where a lot of this conflict is happening. Um, you've got dozens, the, the Mon, the Chin, uh, the Rakhine and the Kareni. These are the, the biggest, uh, the most prominent uh, ethnic minorities or ethnic nationalities as they prefer to be called in Burma. And since independence there has been conflict with these ethnic minority groups who have uh, different stages of Burma's history formed their own uh, political organizations and their own armed wing of those political organizations. And conflict has been ongoing in Burma since the late 1940s. Um, first of all, with the Karen National Union uh, in the East, they were the first major group to mobilize and um, the Kachin independence organization they formed in the early 1960s. Um, and then you've got Shan, you, you've got a plethora of armed groups in Burma, some of which have explicit political aims, some of which are uh, not much more than uh, drug lord armies uh, protecting their own uh, poppy fields and methamphetamine production. Some of which are like people's militia forces, which come under the, mm, the Burma army's control, the sort of proxies in the ethnic areas. So uh, I, I think approximately there's about 100,000 non state uh, armed soldiers in Burma uh, to this day. So I think this is why the peace process and national reconciliation is the most. Uh, difficult and perhaps arguably the most significant issue facing Burma um, when we're talking about transition um, and all the problems and difficulties and challenges of incorporating the aspirations of the ethnic people in Burma um, because they've never been addressed before. So, a little bit of historical context. The Panmon Agreement, which was mentioned in the video, that was an agreement um, with General Aung San, who is Do Aung San Suu Kyi's father, who is the hero of Burmese independence. And this was an agreement signed with um, some of the ethnic nationalities of northern Burma, the Chin, the Kachin, and the Shan. And this was the only time where there was real autonomy uh, that was granted to um, ethnic minorities in Burma and it's seen as a very symbolic uh, time, a very symbolic agreement um, and so the term the, the spirit of Panglong is often used when talking about trying to get peace in Burma. Um, the Panglong agreement was never followed through, Aung San was assassinated. Um, and the successive governments, military regimes have never adhered to this agreement. So when civil war broke out, uh, another caveat to Burma's uh, history of civil war is that the Communist Party of Burma was for many years the biggest armed group in Burma. They weren't based on ethnic lines uh, and they controlled huge, uh, large amounts of territory. Um, they eventually, and they got a lot of support from China too, they eventually disbanded in the late 1980s and out of the Communist Party uh, of Burma, out of this army, um, a few other minor, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say minor, a few other uh, ethnic armed groups came out of this in northern Shan state. Um, most prominent is the Wa, also the Kokang, the Monga, and they have been traditionally uh, having drug fiefdoms essentially. Um, political aspirations are quite different to the Karen, the Shah, the Kachin. They, the, the groups that came out of the Communist Party of Burma um, are heavily armed and have made their money and bought their arms through opium production and methamphetamine uh, factories. More methamphetamine factories these days. Um, as Gareth said, 1962 was the, the military coup. There was a military coup between 58 and 60, but this was invited by the government. 
They handed back power in 1960 and the military forcefully took power again in 1962. And so since then, uh, Burma has been ruled by yeah, a brutal military dictatorship which has sought to destroy the ethnic uh, armed groups through force. Um, one such thing introduced in the 1970s was the Four Cuts policy, particularly Savage, and this um, massively affected the civilian population of the ethnic areas. Um, it also created a huge amount of displacement, so along the Thai border. In Mesa, where, where I work, the refugee camps, there's officially 130,000 refugees who fled eastern, mostly eastern Burma. Um, these living in camps along the Thai Burma border. There's also huge amounts of undocumented migrants who come over the border, and some of it's economic reasons, but a lot of the reasons why people become refugees is because of the direct impact of, of conflict and the human rights violations that um, are related to the militarization um, in ethnic areas. The 1990s, there were some ceasefire agreements, um, very fragile, not institutionalized, um, for example, the Kachin, which we saw in the video, they, saw, they had one in 1994, it lasted for 17 years. <clears throat> but what you see in that period of time is the Burma army exploited uh, Kachin state, the natural resources in Kachin state, of which it is very rich in natural resources. Um, but there was no real benefit to the Kachin people, and the, the there was no progress made towards a sustainable peace solution and conflict um, broke out again with the Kachin in 2011. Um, but the border guard forces, the little caveat to this is that they are controlled by the Burma army and they are often renegade brigades of the ethnic armed groups who've made private deals with the Burma army um, and they've come to control of the Burma army but they operate in ethnic areas and they're very much responsible for a lot of the human rights abuses occurring today um, in the ethnic areas. So as Garrett pointed out, last uh, three years we've seen, we've definitely seen some changes in Burma um, Positive effects and negative effects since President Thein Sein came to power. Um, regarding the peace process, um, ceasefires, initial ceasefire agreements have been signed with most of the ethnic armed groups in Burma now, apart from the Kachin and also the Ta'ang, who operate in northern Shan state. Um, but these have been signed up to oh well over two years ago, and there still hasn't been any progress towards what the ethnic people and the ethnic armed groups want and that is um, a political settlement which grants autonomy, uh, decentralization, natural resource management um, and I think most importantly and urgently an end to the human rights abuses that are occurring because the Burma army are still in that area. Even if there's a non -com even if there's a ceasefire area the human rights violations that are occurring. If it's a conflict area, then they're obviously still occurring and they're much worse. Um, we've also seen, as regards the peace talks, ethnic, uh, a degree of ethnic solidarity. So a lot of the different ethnic armed groups coming together. We've got an alliance the United Nationalities Federal Council. Um, and they're currently neg neg trying to negotiate as a bloc. Um, with the Burma government. This is, the solidarity is obviously good, um, but there are also differences among them, um, which we'll, we'll come to later. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the violence in Arakan State, which I'm sure you've read a lot about in the news, the religious violence, um, because I think this is quite a separate issue. Um, the, it's, it's communal, it's not, um, it's not armed groups of, it's, it's not like uh, specific armies of um, nationalist Arakan people. Um, 
And so this is another point towards national reconciliation, but I'm not going to talk about it. I believe there's another presentation later. But yeah, there's still 100,000 soldiers. So yeah, so there is progress. There is definitely progress. There has been a ceasefire signed. There's more dialogue occurring between the ethnic groups and the government, but there's still a lot of problems. Conflict areas, active conflict. In the last few weeks, you've seen an escalation in these conflicts. More Burma army attacks on Kachin and Ta'ang positions. Um, this is great. 100,000 internally displaced people since the reforms began uh, in northern Burma, in Kachin, in northern Shan state. And from 18 months, they say blocked all humanitarian aid. They couldn't go. They couldn't. He wouldn't let the UN agencies, humanitarian agencies, get to the IDP camps because he said uh, it's not safe. And so the, there's more aid trickling in now, but there's nowhere near enough. Uh, in the conflict areas, human rights, it's very serious human rights and pervasive um, human rights violations are occurring. Sexual assault, gang rape, torture, arbitrary arrest, um, extrajudicial killings forced labour. This is systematic and it's both uh, and the Burma army are the main perpetrators of this. Human rights violations are also being committed by the ethnic armed groups but not to the same scale uh, and it's as the, the Burma army itself and there's been various documentations of this by human rights documentation groups including the Women's League of Burma um, about the cases um, of sexual assault, of, of torture, of, of extrajudicial killing. Um, and of course, the, the, there's more and more Burma army battalions in these areas. In the Ta'ang, it's doubled from 16 to 30 in the past year. Uh, the ceasefire areas, the, where there has been ceasefire sand in the last couple of years, A, the, the human rights violation, the human rights situation has changed a little bit. There are less of the torture, of the extrajudicial killing, um, of the sexual violence as, is, as was occurring before. Um, this is one of the patterns. But due to the increased militariz militarization, um, there are a lot more Burma army troops in the ethnic areas and these are in areas where they couldn't go before because there was no ceasefire because they were scared of being attacked by the ethnic armed groups. Now they've signed the ceasefire, they're able to reinforce and resupply the military bases and go to areas where they couldn't go before. Um, an example of this, I, I spoke to a, a Karen woman who told me that before the Burma army bases were made of bamboo, but now they're made of concrete. Um, and so this is, there's a huge deficit of trust between ethnic people and uh, the Central Burma Army, particularly the Central Burma State, the Central Burma people even. And this remilitarization is not doing anything to help this, any kind of trust building which we obviously need for the peace process. Um, another example which uh, are in the ceasefire areas where the human rights situation has got worse is land confiscation related to development projects, both internal, external investors. Um, a lot of the ethnic areas, as I said, are rich in natural resources. So now that you've got businesses closely linked with the Burma army, closely linked with the government, they are taking land from communities, from villages, for mining projects, for plantations. Um, hydro, big hydropower projects like dams on the Salween River. Um, this is increasing. Uh, another new pattern is the drug trade, uh, particularly methamphetamines in Karen State, which is being peddled uh, by the border guard forces, which are under the Burma Army. Um, they're involved in the production and the sale, and the social impacts of this are. Uh, obviously extremely negative and getting worse. And this is done by Burma Army's proxy, the Border Guard Forces. So, prospects for peace. Um, I think it's important to point out that this is a 
We've not really been at this stage before. Burma hasn't been at this stage since conflict uh, first broke out uh, post-independence. It's definitely unprecedented. There's more ethnic cooperation. There's more dialogue. Um, the Burma government has its own body, the, the, its, its own team of dedicated people working on the peace process. You know, trying to get ceasefire agreements, etc., etc. There's international support. Japan for the Nippon Foundation, um, you know, who are providing support. Uh, the MPSI, which is a Norway-backed initiative, um, and there's various World Bank, EU funding for the Myanmar Peace Center. So there is this support internationally for the peace process, but the real structural issues have not been addressed yet, and that's natural resource management, uh, power sharing, autonomy, um, and equality for ethnic people, um, and also the role of the military, which is huge, which is the most powerful institution in Burma, and remains unreformed, and we're still committing human rights violations, we're still conducting offensives. This is a, these are key issues which have still not been addressed, you know, two and a half years into this peace process, over two years since initial agreements have been signed. And uh, related to the army, I think the biggest, for me, the biggest impediment in the peace process is the military. And the disconnect between what the government says and the government's peace team, which often promises many things to the ethnic armed groups, and the military itself. So this is a quote from President Thing saying very recently, uh, last month, I mean, yeah, and he said, all national races are to establish the national unity based on the Panglong spirit, and then march towards a peaceful, modern, and democratic nation through a federal system. So I think two things I want to pick up on there. The Panglong spirit, as I mentioned before, is evocative of this time when there was you know, ethnic people felt like the, you know, there was autonomy and there was a, a de devolution of power. The, that was the agreement in the 1940s. So the fact that the president thinks saying a former general himself brings up the Panglong spirit, I think, is is very appealing to ethnic to ethnic people. Um, and he also mentions a federal system, which is what a lot of the political groups have been calling for. Um, so this is, you know, extremely positive. But then here we got uh, the commander in chief of the armed forces, Min Aung Hlaing. He said this late last year. We made peace agreements, but that doesn't mean that we are we are afraid to fight. We are afraid of no one. There is no insurgent group we cannot fight or dare not to fight. So here, yeah, the words of these two men is very they contrast, they contradict. It's but you can't have peace without the Burma army on board and as of yet they've given no indication that they are on board with the peace process. Um, there was, hasn't been any regional commanders uh, who can control the actions of the Burma army on the ground. They have not attended any of the peace talks yet. Minong Klein has not attended any of the peace talks yet. Um, so there is this huge disconnect and until this disconnect um, is addressed until the Burma army comes under civilian power um, at the moment, the prospects are not looking good because they are completely unreformed. Um, yeah. yeah, another example. With the Kachin conflict, President Feng Sein ordered the halt all offensives, halt any attacks by the Burma army, and a week later the Burma army continued attacking Kachin uh, outposts. And so a lot of this political uh, aspirations of the ethnic armed groups and the ethnic nationality people is uh, there's a big obstacle in the way in the 2008 constitution which entrenches Burma army power, entrenches the, the Burma, the military institution as the most powerful in the country uh, and it grants very, very little autonomy to ethnic regions. This was a constitution that was, uh, it's generally seen as a bit of a sham, well, 
in Sham by people in Burma. It was voted ostensibly, it was agreed upon by a referendum in 2008 by 90 something percent of the people. This was just a few days after Cyclone Nargis, uh, which devastated Burma and killed up to 200,000 people. They carried on with the referendum anyway. No one really believes that 90 odd percent of people in Burma voted for this constitution, which entrenches the same institution that has repressed them for decades and decades. Um, one of the things is that it grants impunity. Burma army soldiers cannot be investigated um, under civilian courts. Engaged in 25% power in the parliament, and it devolves very, very little autonomy to uh, regional um, political bodies such as regional um, parliaments. There was a constitution. There is a constitution review committee. Uh, which is a, a small step towards, you know, amending this document. Uh, but so far, its uh, its recommendations to the Parliament have been minimal as regards to making substantial difference. Um, as I mentioned before about unity, um, this is an opportunity between the ethnic groups. This is an opportunity, and it's a it's a challenge. There's rivalries between the groups, um, personal, political, territorial. The, there's rivalries within the ethnic groups. Um, people have different ideas of how they want to go about the peace process. Um, for example, there's the UNFC, which I mentioned earlier, but there's also the Working Group for Ethnic Coordination, which is, and they, they have clashed a little bit before. Um, and they still, currently, they still can't agree on a nationwide ceasefire, which is something the Burma government really wants. They want this big show in Nikido, of Nikido, the capital, of all the ethnic groups signing a ceasefire, and they can turn with the UN observers, international presence, say, look, we've got peace. We're still a long way from that. A lot of people don't even agree to uh, have a nationwide ceasefire without. Um, guarantees of political dialogue. Um, yeah. Another big problem or big challenge for prospects for peace is the group that I mentioned earlier that came out of the Communist Party of Burma, the United Wild State Army, primarily drug producing uh, militia. But they're also the best armed group in Burma. Third up to 30,000 extremely well-armed, well-trained soldiers. Um, and for the most part, they're not involved in the political negotiations with the other ethnic armed groups. Uh, I think they're quite happy. They've got the territory, they've got the money. I think they want the status quo to remain. And so, also, the, there's reports that they buy weapons from China still. This is a huge issue. 30,000 very well-armed troops hasn't been addressed yet. Um, the Burma army, I think, is manoeuvring to get a bit more leverage on them. They've been attacking some positions near the near Wa territory, um, which then puts them face to face with the Wa State Army. So, if there is any future uh, discussions with the Wa Army, then the Burma army are in that position where they can say, "Look, we're here. We're in front of you." Um, yeah. So this is another issue that hasn't been addressed yet. So I'm going to go to ways forward. Uh, the constitution is a big obstacle. It entrenches the political power for the Burma army and doesn't give any autonomy to the outlying regions. Uh, there's debates over amending it or completely rewriting it. People have different opinions. Either way, the constitution needs to be addressed. Um, natural resource management, as we've seen, the, the ethnic regions are full of natural resources and these, these have been exploited and no benefit, very, very little benefit has gone to the people in these communities. Um, this is an issue that needs to be addressed. Impunity is enshrined in the constitution, the Burma Army is committing to this day awful human rights violations and there's nothing that people nothing that anybody can do about it. There is a National Human Rights Commission, but 
the chairman of this explicitly stated they can't investigate abuses committed in conflict zones. So it, at the moment, this is a very impotent institution. Peace talks, civil society participation has been minimal um, because it's not just the ethnic armed groups who have aspirations, it's the people who they're supposed to represent. Um, so civil society participation in peace talks needs to be institutionalized and it needs to uh, occur including women's groups. Women's voices have been sidelined so far um, from the peace process. Refugee return, um, we're going to have a talk on refugee return later, but this is a huge issue because a lot of where they fled from, a lot of the issues that they you know, that caused them to flee, landmines, military, Burma army in their village, active conflict zones, these still exist. Um, so, and also, they go back to the land and the land isn't there anymore. There's a factory on it, there's a plantation on it. So, the Burma army wants the refugees to return because it's, it's not very good publicity to say we're a peaceful democratic nation now, but then we have over 100,000 people on the, Thai, on, on the Thai side who are too scared to come home. Um, this can't be a rushed process. Um, another, another issue that needs to be addressed, the way forward, is that decades of conflict has left disparity between the, and Garrett mentioned this earlier, between the cities in central Burma and the rural ethnic areas. So, you know, basic services, health, education, sanitation, uh, in, in many areas affected by the conflict are uh, at a very low level. And another point is that any peace agreement needs to be institutionalized. So far, none of the agreements have been institutionalized. We've got an election next year, 2015, massive election. Um, what happens if the next government turns up in terms of peace agreements. I mean, this has happened in other countries before, so peace agreements need to be institutionalized. So, to conclude, I think that we are, Burma is at a point of opportunity. Um, unprecedented, but we're only, Burma is only a, a tiny little bit of the way down this this path to national reconciliation to sustainable peace. Um, a fragile ceasefire is what we've got at the minute. In many areas, this is not enough. This is only a tiny part of the way towards an actual sustainable peace agreement. And I think when you look at any other context of civil war, that it is a long process, but unless the grievances, and unless the, uh, the aspirations of uh, ethnic nationality people are addressed, which they haven't been yet, um, then we're still a long, long way towards um, a sustainable peace agreement in, in Burma. Thank you. And so I think uh, I haven't got a few minutes for some questions. that. Um, so the question was why is it that the, what's the, the, root, the root reason why the Kachin have not yet signed a ceasefire um, whereas many of the other ethnic armed groups have signed a ceasefire. Um, I think a lot of this is based on the previous experience of ceasefire between 94 and 2011 where they did have a ceasefire and it led to rampant exploitation and militarization of Kachin areas without any political dialogue. And so for the Kachin, they want to have political dialogue or guarantees of a political dialogue um, before they will sign um, a ceasefire. And so until the Burma government can give them that, then that's why they haven't entered.
into a CSMAT. Uh, what is the cooperation or the lack of cooperation between Burma and China? Okay, so the question was what's the degree of cooperation or lack of cooperation between Burma and Thailand in particular with regard to, to refugees? Um, so at the moment, I think that I'm not an authority on that particular question, but I don't think there is much cooperation between um, the two governments on the issue of, of refugees. There is a lot of cooperation between the two countries on the economic development projects. Um, the way special economic zone in particular, down in southern, southern Burma, um, for a long time, Thailand gave tacit support to the FDR groups on its border because they saw it as a buffer to the Communist Party of Burma, which was further north. Um, that changed in the late 80s, early 90s, and so there is, a, there is more cooperation now um, economically on, on the drugs trade. Um, but regarding specifically on the refugee issue, um, Take the example of Japan. Um, Japan is providing support through the Nippon Foundation, um, and they are trying to help, you know, logistics for the for the ethnic armed groups, and also to provide some humanitarian aid to internally displaced people. Um, so this is what Japan is doing for the peace process. But at the same time, uh, I saw a plan recently from JICA. Uh, which is to develop uh, large parts of eastern Burma into special economic and industrial zones with the refugees returning to work in these industrial zones and this is a, a lot of Japanese uh, the Japanese development arm and Japanese businesses will benefit greatly from this and so on one hand you've got okay, we're, we're negotiating peace on the other hand we're going to benefit economically from this um, I think that it can be good if the intention is right. I think it can be good if these third party actors genuinely consult civil society and not just give legitimacy to one side or the other. Um, but I think also whichever third party actor becomes involved in the peace process, then they take on a responsibility and they need to be aware that, uh, okay, they are not the ones with guns, but now they have a responsibility. Um, so, yeah, good and bad. Right. I'm curious to ask your opinion about going back to the United Hua State Army. You, uh. you pointed out that they are the largest non-state army with about 30,000 soldiers, yet they are not included in the current peace talks. And you, you mentioned that you believe that they prefer the status quo, which enables them to profit from drug production and trafficking. What, what is the hesitation on the part of the national government from engaging with the wall? Um, okay, so the question was about the wall, which is the largest non-state army. Um, and the question was as regards to why is the Burma government uh, reticent to, to negotiate with the, with the wall? Um, I think that there is, I mean, I think there is negotiation. It's limited, but there is negotiation. They have a ceasefire agreement, which they signed a couple of years ago. Um, 
But I think I think there's an element of trepidation as regards to negotiating with the war. Um, and I think that there's <coughs> it's just such an inaccessible place for the most part. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's trepidation because they are so well armed. But there is, I mean, there, there is limited negotiation. Um, yeah. Uh, perhaps, Alex, it would be a good idea to say something about what you think of the role of Norway in, uh, because Norway has been heavily involved in this peace process with their support of the NPSI. And I personally had an encounter with Norwegian Foreign Minister in Yangon on the subject of hydropower dams. And I pointed out to him that uh, the Kareni people had specifically objected to a Norwegian company involving hydropower building a dam in Kareni State without any kind of consultation whatsoever. So I asked him what exactly is Norwegian foreign policy in relation to peace talks and trade and investment and resources. Perhaps you'd like to take it on. Okay. Um, just to repeat that, um, the question was regarding Norway's involvement in the peace process, um, given that they also have significant interest in, in hydropower. Um, yeah, Norway. The Myanmar Peace Support Initiative, which is a Norway-backed peace support initiative um, to provide humanitarian aid to set up liaison offices, um, various bits and pieces uh, regarding the peace process. It came under a lot of heavy criticism for it didn't consult widely enough with civil society as to what their input was. It came under criticism because it, it was affiliated with the Myanmar Peace Centre, which is a government body. Um, and so therefore, um, it was seen as signing with the government. Um, and various of the criticisms of, the, of Norway's involvement, I think that uh, regarding business interests, I mean, Norway's foreign policy, and I read a quite an interesting article, an academic article about this, is that Norwegian NGOs, no, Norwegian businesses, and Norwegian government, the all interlinked personnel-wise, so people who perhaps work for government, then work for NGOs, then work for uh, businesses, and so there is this, um, you know, the, it's almost like one package. Um, there are Norwegian businesses who want to come into Burma, they run one of the most lucrative uh, contracts with the Burma government um, a year a little over a year ago for telecommunications, telemall on this. Um, the amount of money they gave to the MPSI is minimal compared to the amount of money that they could seek to make from hydropower, from telecommunications, from other natural resources, from oil and gas of which um, they will be bidding for some of the tenders that are now opening for the oil and gas reserves in Burma. So this is another issue of intention. Um, I mean, I'm not doubting that people, as part of MPSI, want peace. But the people who fund the MPSI, the people who um, are real drivers of this, are also close to the Norwegian business interests. And so I think with any... Uh, another caveat to Norway's involvement is the... Um, the Sri Lanka debacle. Um, and I think people in Burma, are, some ethnic leaders are aware of what happened in Sri Lanka um, and of the, how they, uh, the Tamils were crushed militarily and the massacre of civilians there and the delegitimization um, of the non state armed group there. And I think this is an, uh, and obviously Norway was. Uh, a peace broker in this, so I think there is trepidation regarding the Sri Lanka experience. Also, yeah, yeah there's one more question. Ah, um, so 
value, but I think it's quite uh, not, not a question, rather I like to echo what you were that uh, what, what you uh, your presentation is doing is quite um, I think it's covered a lot. But I must say I'm, I'm from the Council Institute, so I don't know if you have heard of it. It's a new new sort of uh, working group that's set up in Shema to provide research initiatives and uh, technical support for an organization that engages in smart um, um, but thank you for the presentation, but I just, just want to say that sometimes the military or the government paint the picture of the peace process in a more complex and, and because of so many diverse and group. But now the enemy has come together uh, even a while uh, I'm talking with the other groups. Um, so the, the roadmap is, is for the peace process, it's just a fundamental difference. And the groups wanted to have political dialogue so they can um, uh, um, uh, discuss the problem properly so they can end the civil war so there's such single peace and they can develop their area. But on the other hand, the military simple simplified is no um, ethnic issue. Uh, just say, okay, give up your arms and, and, and uh, come to the election. Uh, if you look at carefully, the ethnic group has been fighting for more than half a century, and there's a very severe lack of trust between the ethnic group and the army. It needs a lot of uh, political dialogue. Um, the ceasefire is not just the, the uh, 1990 ceasefire, it's not the only one. It's in, the, in the past, so many ceasefires took place that there was no proper political dialogue. So none of them has become a class problem or meaningful uh, solution to the problem. I think now the history is about to repeat unless the political dialogue is taking place. This is what all the ethnic groups are pushing. And um, like Alex mentioned, at the peace table, there's no significant or regional combat at the time to say. They use um, the Myanmar Peace Center as a uh, middle so man to carry message. So Myanmar Peace Center is supposed to be a middle man to facilitate peace. But what has become is it's now become a true or, or something that's such an interest in the military. That's what the ethnic become so concerned about. They, they feel that they have no, no um, their interest has not been presented or that's been. Sorry, this is the story. I'd like to add that this, this is the big picture is uh, between what happened in the uh, peace process. <laughs> um, okay, I think to summarize, I'm um, sorry, the, the, there hasn't been any political dialogue here, and this is this is this is the main point, and that the um, the Myanmar Peace Center is um, it carries messages, but it doesn't have um, and there was no Burma high level Burma Army personnel in any of the, the peace talks. Um, and that, okay, we've, we've had ceasefires before, but until there is this political dialogue, then we might, Burma might make the same mistakes as before. Does that summarize? Uh, yeah, yeah, but it also needs to look at how the military play strategically. They, they selectively take whatever uh, the ethnic uh, concerns are. And of course, the main message of federalism and the dialogue often uh, sideline. The military is interested in negotiating between different groups rather than collective groups. So this is what the military is trying to maintain and dominate. Yeah, so that the military strategy is to sideline um, aspirations of, of federalism and also to negotiate separately with the, with the ethnic armed groups. And this is a strategy used by the, by the military. Got one more question? Or? I think we have to move on for the next presentation. But I, so thank you very much to Alex.